go live right now. Yeah. Mental health, COVID-19, round two. Coming at you. I think, I think we are. Yes, we are. I'm looking at us on Facebook right now. We are live. Everybody jump on. Come on in. I'm sharing it right now on my social media feed. We're right, uh, live for mental health, COVID-19, round two. And uh, the reason why we're doing a round two, y'all, is pretty simple. Because the first time we did this, uh, it got such incredible engagement, not just the night of, but throughout the week. And then there were so many comments with questions that we could not answer that immediately I got with Adrian and I got with Brian. And I said, we got to circle back and do this uh, all over again because uh, there's just such a great interest and great need for us. So welcome, everybody. Share this right now. Share, share, share. Push it out on your feed. Get as many of our Northeast folks and your friends on here as possible. Uh, hey, Jess, glad you're here. Hey, everybody. Um, hey, Lindsay jump on. Okay, uh, real quick, uh, announcement for you. This weekend during the sermon time, uh, I think it's important for everybody in this audience to know, we're actually preaching on mental health. Uh, I just feel like this has emerged as, oh, we already knew this was an issue, right? One out of five people at the very least struggle with mental health issues, and, uh, and I think it's an issue for the church because the church either talks about it in all the wrong ways or doesn't talk about it at all, and so we didn't want to be that kind of church. So we already knew it was an issue, and our church talks about it a lot. COVID-19 has, uh, has only exacerbated the, the problem even worse, so we're preaching about it this weekend. Make sure you invite any friends who need to see it or make sure you're there uh, for that, and then we've also launched some uh, connection care groups for you guys around mental health during this season. So if you go to necchurch.org backslash anywhere, somebody put that link in the comment section for me, necchurch.org backslash anywhere. And uh, at the top, you click on the word connection. What you'll see are there are peer support groups for healthcare professionals, peer support groups for educators. There's a grief support group, self-care during a pandemic, and also uh, overcoming fear and fighting anxiety support groups out there. And, uh, and I think those will be powerful and helpful. So if those are of uh, interest to you at all, get on them. All right. That having been said, uh, real quick introduction. So everybody remembers who you guys are. Um, Adrian, you go first. Introduce yourself. Brian next. And then we'll get to the questions. Start sending your questions, by the way. Send them. Send them. I am Adrian Feldman, the online campus pastor here at Northeast. And uh, really excited to be here. Hi, Adrian. That's all I got. Sorry, Brian. You got to say more stuff. <laughs> My name is Brian Woodring. Glad to be here tonight. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist. I work at Freedom Counseling Services here in Louisville. I primarily work with police officers and veterans, but I work with a wonderful group of with nine other therapists, and we are all um, we're all doing this everything that we can to uh, to help people through this really crazy time right now. So I'll remind you guys we have a list of questions right here that Adrian and Brian have been brainstorming based on our. A connection with lots of different people but if you have questions send them in right now we would rather talk about what you want to rather than what we think you want to so uh there's only one way to know how what you want to talk about that's if you tell us so uh text them in or uh comment them in not text them all right uh, let's start with the first question i always love to start with this whenever we're talking about mental health so for some of you this may sound like a broken record if you've been at northeast for a couple of years but uh, adrian i'll kick it to you first uh one you're a pastor and uh, two, you're also somebody who has struggled with mental health issues for uh, most of your life. So is it a sin to struggle, Pastor? Is it a sin? It's not a sin to struggle. It's not a sin to struggle. And I say that over and over again. Just like got to beat that like a, wait, mixing metaphors. But, you know, um, you got to, it's like a broken record. It's yeah. not a sin to struggle. It's not a sin to struggle. It's not a sin to struggle. Um, and I, you'll hear me say this a million times. You'll hear, hear Tyler say it too. Um, it, the very basis of Christianity, you guys, is the very best person experiencing the very worst pain. So don't get it in your head that if you're good enough, then you won't have hard times. It's not a sin to struggle. Yeah. I mean, J Jesus's last 24 hours are proof of this. Like if you look at his hardest day, the hardest day of his life, from like Gethsemane to Golgotha on the cross, there are two moments where you see him under extreme mental struggle. One is in Gethsemane where it says he is so anxious he is literally sweating blood, right? This is Jesus we're talking about here. The others, um, when he's hanging on the cross, he literally shouts at the top of his lungs, 
uh, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He senses this forsakenness. Um, now, what makes Jesus uh, what makes Jesus a great example is that he takes this to God. And what makes him an even better example is after he sweats blood in the garden, he says, your will be done, God. Is there any other way? If there is, let's roll, but your will be done. And on the cross, he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then in the next breath and on his last breath, last breath he says, my father, I entrust you. Uh, my spirit into your hands. So there's like this tension between, like, I, I'm struggling. It, it, it is what it is. I'm going to take it to God, but also I'm going to trust God. So now it's not a sin to struggle. We see Jesus himself modeling for us what that looks like. Um, let me ask you this. Are there any other Bible characters or, um, or Bible stories that come to mind when it comes to mental health struggles that people should be reading or looking into this week? So many. There are so many. Brian, you want to take that? Um, first one that comes to mind is, is David. It was, it's pretty clear that David at some point was yes. depressed. you absolutely know that he was angry. He was the only man in the Bible described as a man after God's own heart. And yet in Psalms 42, he's like basically asking himself, having this conversation with himself, what is wrong with me? Why am I so downcast? Why am I so sad? What's disturbing me? The really cool thing about it though, is that he's asking these questions. He's exploring what's going on but then he goes you know what yet i'm gonna praise god i'm still gonna praise him despite i despite the fact i have all this stuff going on gosh the psalms are like a case study in in praying through your mental health struggles and honesty before god we were talking about this just yesterday uh but adrian and i if you read psalm 88 um you get the clear distinct sense that david's suicidal in that like he he literally says darkness is my closest friend. So, um, the, you know, what makes the heroes of the scriptures so, uh, I don't know, so connect, connectable, I guess, or personable for me and also powerful is not that they're perfect, but their faithfulness through some of the imperfections that they, uh, that they struggle with, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, um, I am always struck by Elijah's story in first Kings chapter 19. He is, I mean, just straight suicidal. He goes out into the wilderness and is like, I, mm -hmm. I'm ready to die. Like God just let me die. And I think a, a lot of people can relate with that. I think there are a lot of people out there who have struggled that much. And, you know, he, um, he laid down and went to sleep and God sent him an angel with some hot bread and some fresh water, some snacks, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, we see that kind of struggle all over the Bible. And I think it's really beautiful to know that those of us who are struggling have a place where we can go to know that we're not alone. We're not crazy. We are not um, so separate from God as we might think. You and bread. Okay. We'll come <laughs> to this. Okay. So I just got a question from um, somebody in the comments. Uh, they said, look, I, I struggle with anxiety and I feel like I'm letting God down because he tells us not to be anxious. Do you think my faith is not strong enough? Do you think my faith is not strong enough? Struggle with anxiety. Do you think my faith is not strong enough? I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, part of, I think what Elijah was, was struggling with was anxiety. Um, and yet God ministered to him. He didn't see him in a different light. If you look at the story of Jonah, uh, you know, disobeyed God, went and, you know, got eaten by a fish, swallowed up by a fish, and then went back and ended up going and doing what God asked him to do. And he was still ticked off. He was still angry with God. And it, and it says in Jonah uh, chapter four, it says that God, even after Jonah saying all these things to him about how angry he is and he wishes that he could die, God spoke to him with compassion. God doesn't hold that. He knows that we're human. He doesn't hold that against us hold that against us at all he's a compassionate and a loving god and he's still ministering to us it doesn't have anything to do with our faith i think the most faithful thing that you can do in the face of anxiety or depression or suicidal thoughts or any of that stuff is to take all of that to him to just say god i know that you're god and i trust you and i trust you with these feelings that are hard and heavy and and difficult <laughs> and that, that is what faith looks like so uh, Philippians 4, 6, it's part of the passage I'm going to preach this weekend. So I love that this question was brought up. Philippians 4, 6 says, do not worry about anything. And that Greek word there for worry is actually uh, could be uh, synonymous to anxious. So do not be anxious about anything. But Paul writes, 
in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let your requests be made known to God. So basically, Paul says uh, there is a difference between saying, um, between saying, I don't think I can get through this, and God, I don't think I can get through this. It's like as simple as that. There's a difference between saying, uh, you know, uh, I think I'm going to die. Saying, God, I think I'm going to die. Uh, like it, it is as simple as adding that word and making the addressee different because when you take it to God, you now have a point of reference for truth and you're also taking the first step towards trust. So uh, like it is literally as simple as that. I love that. It, take it to God. He can handle it, right? He can handle it. Okay, so let's jump into the next set of questions here because some of these are, are really, really good. Um, how about this? What are some really good habits – that can come out of this season. COVID-19 has disrupted everything. Our lives look totally different. So all of us are, are forming new routines, new habits. What are some good ones that can come out of this season? You know, my favorite habits coming out of the season are, uh, they all have to do with my relationships with other people, which is weird because we're in a season where we actually can't be with people face to face, but I catch myself picking up my phone and texting people I love literally every single day. Hey, how can I be praying for you today? Um, I catch myself using my telephone to talk to people. I didn't even know they still did that. I didn't know <laughs> you could make phone calls. FaceTime is not a thing that my generation does until now. Um, but you know, I feel like I am using apps to talk to my siblings and I feel like I'm talking to my grandpa. And, and all of that, I, I love the habits that I have started to find in connecting with people. And we're learning what relationships are really important to us and finding new ways to invest in them. And I think that's really cool. I love that you say that because uh, I was just saying this to Brian earlier. I feel like at work in particular, our staff is socially distanced. Mm-hmm. Like most of our staff's working remotely. Uh, uh, and, uh, and yet, Right now, I feel like there's this bonding happening among our team because we're facing something really hard and really challenging, um, but we're facing it with resiliency and mission, and we like feel like, man, we got to rise to this occasion. So like we're climbing this hard, uh, hard mountain, fighting this battle together, and I feel like we're going to come on the other side of COVID-19 uh, actually closer, not further apart, but closer as a team. I've never felt more appreciated and respected by our team than ever before as a leader. And uh, at the same time, I've never felt as inspired and uh, also as proud of our, our staff team at Northeast ever before. So it's, it's strange how God can bring these relationships together. What do you think, Ryan? I, I agree with what both of you are saying. I think there's, there's obviously there's a lot of self-help things that we can start to develop. I mean, because obviously we have a lot of time and we start to practice mindfulness. We can uh, be more aware of our thoughts and things like that kind of going with some of the relational stuff, you know, we can develop uh, develop habits with our families, with our kids that hopefully maybe they can be, uh, maybe they can be lifelong things that we do, or at least very memorable. I know that uh, over spring break, it was, you know, obviously a huge bust for most all of us, but, uh, you know, my wife and I decided, hey, let's, let's do a camp out in the backyard. So we you know, nicknamed it Camp Corona, and we had, you know, we go <laughs> out, and we had a fire and s'mores and music, and we we slept in the tent, and I got up the next morning, got the fire going again, and granted, I was the only one that sat outside and ate breakfast by the fire while everyone went back inside, but it was, it was memorable, it was fun, we had a good time together, um, and in all honesty, it's something that we had never done, despite the fact that we have all the gear, so it's just really cool, there's a look, we can be creative with our families. Yeah. Uh, I love that, Brian. Did you know, I just actually saw a thing on Twitter about two minutes ago before this started that said you can, um, for your Zoom calls, and I think this is a great habit, you can actually FaceTime a goat or a llama into the calls. So that's a habit that people could consider. Um, Also, uh, missional living, living going from goats and llamas and transitioning to that. I think that people have had to take their faith into their hands more than ever during these times right now. Um, and I think that there's something powerful happening uh, because of that. So uh, that's really good to see. Uh, any any other ones you'd add to that? Because I want to go to bad habits now. I got one more. Yeah, go. 
um, we're doing this prayer movement at Northeast where we've got somebody praying every minute of every day and have been for how long, Tyler? A while. Since I think it was March 11th, I checked the other day, March 12th, something like that. Yeah, and I am finding that scheduling that time to pray and knowing that my church is counting on me to pray and then spending that intentional half hour in prayer again, knowing somebody's counting on me to do it, um, has started to really take root in my own prayer life. And it's changed the way that I experience prayer. It's changed the way that I connect with God. And then again, relationally, it has affected the way that I, how the way that I connect with other people, because I'm praying for them too. So proud of our church. I think uh, Melinda told me the other day, there's been four, at least 400 unique individuals who have prayed at some point during this prayer movement. So that's incredible. And I think any of these disciplines of disengagement where you're not out doing things, getting your hands dirty, which we were so good at, you know, before COVID-19, we're so good at keeping our hands busy and our lives busy. But now all of a sudden, you know, we're at home. And so these disciplines of disengagement, like prayer, solitude, scripture, reading, rest, um, we, we're getting an opportunity to rediscover those. All right, bad habits, bad habits. What are some really bad habits that uh, folks are developing because of this, besides Joe Exotic? Some of us are eating entire loaves of bread in a day. And there's the bread. There's the bread. <laughs> there's the bread. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I mean, it's getting real easy to eat a lot of junk food because it's hard to buy the things that you're used to buying at the grocery store. And, you know, when you're in there, you feel like you got to buy all the stuff because you don't know when you're coming back again. And some of us are eating all of our kids' Reese eggs. And that's just, you know, how we're we're handling things. Just, I don't know who might be doing that, but. <laughs> so binge eating um also binge watching i've seen uh articles that that estimate anywhere from 25 to 33 percent increase in streaming service consumption and we already were like watching you know netflix and, and hulu and all the stuff way too much um what else well if you want to bring the the, the therapeutic side into it, we're, we're talking about panic eating and we're talking about panic binge watching. We're talking about mm -hmm. panic drinking. Um, we're uh, social media binges that we're not exercising. We don't, uh, we've, we've picked up this thing of we're not on schedules anymore. There's nothing, there's nothing to do. We can't figure out what to do with our time. I have seen several posts on Facebook, you know, is anybody else just wandering around the house all day, taking a nap for three hours and getting up and eating our kids <laughs> Easter eggs and then wandering around the house some more? You know, it's unfortunately the, like the panic, the panic comfort food eating or the panic drinking or whatever, you know, it hits that reward center in the brain right. um, where it becomes an addiction and that releases neurotransmitters and it helps us feel good. We're trying to relieve this stress that we all feel that's kind of pushing down on us. The danger with that is, is that we're waiting for that stress and anxiety to go away. And what do we do when it doesn't? Because right now it's not, it's there. The future is uncertain. You know, I've heard just today in my sessions, I've heard all this is going to be soon. It could be a couple of weeks to we're looking at June or July. And I'm like, nobody knows. So the brain just keeps this craving going. And then we start to crash and it starts this really vicious cycle. So part of it is, you know, we can't walk through the house all day eating sugary cereals and not eat any food, any real food. We have to we have to try to compromise, you know, try to eat healthy during the week and maybe uh, somewhere plan later on to bake cookies with our spouse or with our kids or cookies are my comfort food. So I would probably ask my wife to bake cookies twice instead of just once a week. But um, you gotta show yourself a little grace, right? Exactly. Absolutely. You know, for binge watching, you know, physically set a timer to get up off of our butts and reset the brain so that we kind of break that addictive cycle. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I'm seeing is, that, is the schedule. We need to have a schedule and that's, that's critical for our sleep. Um, for some of us, this almost feels like an impromptu vacation and we stay up late and watch TV or we'll scroll through, scroll through social media and um, but it's really screwing up our sleep and our sleep is what we need that helps with our immune systems and obviously none of us can be immune compromised right now so even though there's we all struggle with these bad habits there's simple ways to try to break them i love what you're saying too about the, the development of habits 
there, this is a biblical principle, okay? It's called the principle of the path. The further you walk down the path, you know, the further down the path you go. You reap what you sow over time. Or the way that we'll say it a lot um, uh, around here is, is decisions determine your direction, and your direction will ultimately determine your destination. Every step you take is a step towards a destination. So, uh, you know, one step might be harmless, but 10 steps, two weeks, two months. Before you know it, you have a habit on your hand that may be very, very difficult to kick. What ended up being a glass of wine, like over a show, you know, a couple nights out of the week with your hubby is now turned into a bottle every other day. And it's like, okay, you know, you got to start thinking about uh, pumping the brakes and making sure you're maintaining a level of self-control. That's a fruit of the spirit as well, self-control. Um, so here's a bad habit that I'm seeing folks post. And uh, I know we wanted to talk about tonight. Um, one of the bad habits is work-life blur. People are working from home. And so they're saying like, you'd think it would be easier to turn it off, but it's not. They're just running over into each other. So what would be your suggestion to people who are struggling with the work-life blur, if you will? I struggle with this a lot myself. Um, and so I'm having to learn this kind of on the fly. We are people who work in the office and I'm used to working in the office and it works for me. And so being at home has been really difficult. Um, and so for me, one of the things that I've been doing that makes a really big difference is when I get to the end of my work day and I close my computer, I put it away. I put it like if I, if it's going to be out in the room that I'm in, then I'm going to <laughs> respond to an email. And next thing I know, I've missed out on an hour that I wanted to be with my family because it was this thing and then this thing and then this thing and then this thing. Because right now for most of us, all of our work is in these magical boxes. And so for me, moving my computer physically away from me has been a game changer. And that is as simple as packing it in the bag and picking it up or, you know, closing it behind a door and leaving it just away from me. That's been a, a big difference for me. You know, it's funny when I first started thinking about this question, um, and I don't know why, but there's an old, old song by back in the sixties by the birds called turn, 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 which is taken straight from the book of Ecclesiastes and talks about, you know, to everything, there's a season and there's a, there's a, um, a time and a purpose to everything under heaven and the whole, and so when I thought about this home life balance, that's exactly what I thought of. And I don't know where, I don't know why I came from. Um, but that's what I thought of. And there is, there has to be, we have to be intentional. And I kind of come back to the whole thing with the schedule. We have to set a schedule. Mm. Um, act like you're going to work. Get up in the morning. Um, please get out of your pajamas and put on clothes. And take a shower and shave and brush your teeth and eat breakfast. Um, the time that you would normally drive into work, go for a quick walk around the block. Um, you're going to, you're going to be in the car anyways. So try to start to develop even, you know, just doing something like that. Um, have a dedicated workspace in your home away from the kids and everything. But yet, you know, at lunchtime, go have lunch with your wife and kids or your husband and your kids, which is probably something that you couldn't do when you're in the office all day long. That's great, man. So I uh, read an article uh, literally a few days ago that said it's the difference between a sustainable routine and survival mode. At first, when everybody transitioned into this, it was like survival mode. And what can I do? And I got to get this work done and I got to, you know, change everything about my workspace. And then now all of a sudden things have normalized. We don't know how long this is going to go. Like I read a Harvard study today that said, if there's no vaccine, we'll be social distancing till 2022. Okay. Some of you are going to turn this <laughs> off because they are freaking out, but, <laughs> but like, we, we don't know how long it's going to go. Right. So what, what's the new routine? Like you had a routine before this, or maybe you had a really bad routine before this. Guess yeah. what? You can wipe the slate clean and start a new sustainable, healthy routine. Um, okay. So uh, let me ask you this. Uh, what if uh, I'm struggling with what to expect of myself? Where is the line between give yourself a little bit of grace and whoa, that's really unhealthy. You need help because like everybody is, you know, under an extra level of stress and anxiety right now. And so we should be giving ourselves a little bit of grace, but at the same time, I mean, you know, we don't want to strive uh, or slide into unhealthy uh, healthy habits. So where's the line? 
this is a question that um, I think you have to process with somebody else. And I might be wrong about that. And Brian can tell me that I'm wrong if I am. Um, but yeah. I have found for myself, like, I, I don't know what that line is. And I needed to bounce it off somebody else. Like, hey, I'm doing these things. And I know this is not who I am. How can I do this in a healthy way? what does healthy look like? Um, that's a good question for your therapist or for your spouse or for somebody who knows you and loves you um, and knows what's normal for you. You know, like you, you sh should have people in your life who you can say, hey, I ate a whole loaf of bread and they're going to be like, hey, stop buying bread. Like, <laughs> I just, I think it's, it's good to find your last 10% person and ask them that question. Say, Hey, I catch myself doing this thing. Can you help me? That's a three mentions of bread, by the way, um, already. Uh, I'm also, not counting. Yeah, I'm not counting. Uh, so, so that's what I call a a, the, the last 10% people in your life. Like you have to have some last 10% people in your life. They could be friends. They could be family. They could be a counselor. They could be all of the above, but you have to have those last 10 percenters who will go there. Because most people are like first 90 percenters and they'll love you and until it gets hard and until that hard truth has to get dropped on you. And like, they're like, well, I don't want to risk the relationship and they might not like me anymore. So I'm not going to say it like that last 10 percent friend's just going to say it because they love you too much to let you keep struggling. I also think um, that uh, we, we hear God's voice from those last 10 percent friends. We hear God's voice through uh, scripture. So if you're ever wondering, is this unhealthy? Well, oftentimes you can do a checkup on scripture and scripture will tell you what's unhealthy. Um, there's gray areas sometimes where you're like, well, the scripture doesn't talk much about that. So I need to go a little further. But sometimes the scripture talks explicitly about stuff. Um, and then uh, I think that if you're a Christian who's walking with the Lord, diving in scripture, praying, trying to connect and grow the Holy Spirit in your conscience, then you can trust your conscience too. The Holy Spirit will take over your conscience over time. So there's a gut level sometimes of maybe there's a reason why I feel uncomfortable about this. Maybe there's a reason. Uh, Brian, what do you think? Uh, dovetailing with what you just said, I think that if we have to ask ourselves, is this a bad habit? Am I justifying this action because of COVID-19? There's a strong likelihood that it is a bad habit and we're justifying our actions because of it. Um, you know, so again, you know, we, we have to show ourselves grace, but there also has to be kind of that aha moment of asking ourselves these, asking ourselves these really difficult questions. And if we can't come up with really good answers as to why we're doing this quote unquote unhealthy thing, then we, we do, we need to go talk to somebody. We need to take some time to figure these things out on our own. I mean, Tyler mentioned this earlier, you know, you know, the, the day drinking, you know, drinking with, you know, Bashir or having wine with the wine up in Ohio or whatever the case may be, yeah. you know, we, we've started to kind of normalize it, but, uh, but the reality is, is that it's not healthy. It starts that we run the risk of it starting that addictive process. And, you know, if this goes on for two, three, four months or whatever, you know, maybe the lucky people uh, only have five, 10, 15 pounds to lose after all of the, out of the added alcohol that they've consumed but maybe the less fortunate people are looking at, oh no, I think I have a problem. I think I have a drinking problem and we're getting back to normal. And I don't know, I don't know how to act in post COVID world because now I have this other stuff going on too. There's a real danger there. Post COVID world, think about that. You know, it's made me think of something. Uh, everybody's using the phrase right now, you know, uh, we have to find a new normal. And part of me uh, feels like, well, well, one, that, that assumes that there was an old normal. Right. And the way that we were living was not normal. It was abnormal and unhealthy in lots of ways. If you think about our culture of overload, you think about how distracted uh, we have become as a society with screens and everything, uh, everything else. Uh, but like, this is not like forever either. So like you're discovering a new normal, it's a temporary new normal. This is not forever, you know? Uh, so, um, I, I, um, I, I don't know where I was really going with that other than to say like that old, the idea of like old normal, new normal, this, that, and the other, uh, you know, like I, there, the old normal was abnormal, man. The old normal was, was not normal at all. It's worth calling out. Really cool to take this time though, this massive disruption, you have the emotional capacity to do it, to start developing some of those new 
good habits that we talked about before, because those can help us emerge from our COVID normal into a new life that we are really excited about, something that that is a lot more life-giving than what we were doing before all of this. Yeah. And I think if we're, add on that real quick, Tyler, I think if we're doing that, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to become stronger people. And so we will realize that we, you know what, we don't want to go back to what was normal because here I was doing X, Y, and Z, but now my new quote unquote, my new normal is I'm a stronger person. I've, you know, kind of been through the fire. I've been purified through this. I've learned these new habits. I've grown closer with my family. I've grown closer with the Lord, with friends. And yeah, and I don't want to go back to that. This is, I'm a better person now. And that's the, I think sometimes we, we lose sight of that. That's a, that's a real possibility coming out of this craziness that we're in right now. Yeah, that's good stuff. So um, we are a church. So let me ask this question. What are some spiritual practices, spiritual practices that people should be leaning into right now to get through their mental health struggles? I think, uh, I think for us as a family, I think one of them has really been leaning into gratitude, um, thanking the Lord for what he's, what he's done for us, how he's blessed us, um, trying to share those blessings with other people, loving on other people, which obviously is, you know, a spiritual practice as well. Um, and I think talking with God, reading his word, um, so often a lot of our unhappiness in our lives comes from listening to our own voices, this negative spin cycle that we have in our heads instead of stopping and listening to what he has to say to us. Yeah. For me, um, the thing that helps the most is worship. And you will, if you're around me for, you know, any longer than a day, you'll find that that's kind of my, my thing that's on repeat. It's worship, worship, worship all the time. Um, I have been through a lot of really dark, really difficult seasons. And so I put together a playlist of songs on Spotify and Tyler talked a few weeks ago about something that he calls defiant worship, this worship that, that kind of boldly proclaims in the face of things that are difficult, that God is God and God is still good no matter what. But sometimes when you are in the Valley and everything is horrible, it's really hard to see that. And it's really hard to believe that. And so, so most of my songs on my own personal worship playlist for, for difficult stuff are songs that get stuck in your head. Because if you start getting this, this repeat chorus, that's like, you are good, you are good, you are good, you are good. Then you, it starts to change the way that you see the world. And you start to remember that God is still good, no matter how hard this thing is. And it can, can do a lot to turn it around. I love that. So both of you guys just hit on it. I think it's important to call out. A lot of times what your mental health struggle will do is it will lie to you. It will lie to you. It'll lie to you about your identity. It'll lie to you about your future. It'll lie to you about your circumstances. Um, it will make you believe things that actually are not true. And so when you feel, all of us have moments of disorientation like that, where we're wondering what's true and where do I turn? In those moments, spiritual practices like listening to scripture soaked music, like uh, consuming, uh, you know, Christian art, uh, if you will, or diving into the scripture and, and, and making sure that you're prayerfully reflecting and meditating over you, reorients you, it grounds you in what you know is true. It grounds your identity in what you know is true. It grounds God's identity in what we know is true of him. Um, it can remind you when you don't feel like you know any, what, what, anything else is true, what actually is true. So for me, I'm like, and I'm a Bible reader anyway, so I'm always going to tell people, get in a scripture reading plan or get on, start reading a book that helps you study scripture better, you know, to remind yourself what is true. What else? Anything else you guys want to throw on there on that one? You know what I have? Somebody sent this to me and I wasn't going to tell you this. Um, last time I was in a really deep, dark struggle, somebody sent me a list of things that God says about you. And I keep it close by so that I can read it so that I can be reminded who God says I am. Because when the depression is lying to me, when I am convinced that it, there's nothing to hold on to, you know, there, there is so much in scripture, so much in scripture that says, God chose you. God loves you. God knows you. You are chosen, not forsaken. I mean, if we're going to go back to worship, but, um, you know, scripture, scripture has a way of reminding you who you are. 
I love that. I love that. That's that's scripture memorization, by the way, is a lost art in our soundbite culture. I mean, just being able to pound some of those things into your head so that you can remember them when the going gets tough is so, so good. All right, um, we're running out of time here. So uh, I'm going to give you guys, uh, let's do one more question here. Uh, it, we just came off Easter weekend. And, uh, and so I would ask you guys this, what do you think the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus has to offer us to help those who are struggling with mental health issues? Brian, you want to take that one first? I would, uh, I would simply say the, the, the promise of a future life, you know, whether it's this life or, or the next, Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection promises us, promises us that new life. Um, and, you know, that made that possible. And that is, uh, sometimes that's the only thing that we can cling to. And sometimes that is the only thing that we need to cling to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to be a, a little vulnerable with my church family, um, you guys, a lot of you know my story. If you've been around Northeast for a little while, um, I have a long history of suicidal thoughts and really, really dark, scary seasons of depression. And um, both of these guys on the screen have walked through some of those things with me. Um, and I have to say that like, I've done all kinds of things to make myself feel better. But the, the one thing that brings me back to life is Jesus and his, his incredible, incredible love for me. Um, and I just have to believe if, if Jesus can raise himself from the dead, then he can breathe new life into me. And he has. And if he hadn't, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I, I shouldn't be alive right now, but I am. And that's because Jesus is alive. I'll give, uh, I'll give everybody this closing word just to like preach with you, Adrian. Um, and if you were here this past Sunday, this is review. The gospel, according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, is a three-day sequence in the life of Jesus. He says, Jesus died, buried, and risen. That's the gospel. Or uh, the Holy Week names for those days are Good Friday, Black Saturday, and then Easter Sunday. And the honest truth is that right now during COVID-19, it feels like Black Saturday. Friday is when everything dies. The pain is searing. Everything gets canceled. Saturday is when that new normal sets in and you begin to realize that life as you know it will never be the same again. And it hurts. And right now, that's where most of us feel like we're living. Feel like we're living on Saturday, day two of the three-day story. And you don't know if day three is ever coming. So what do you do when you're living on Saturday? Well, you can choose to live in that despair or you can choose in light of the risen Jesus to live on Sunday. You can choose new life. You can choose to be loved. You can choose to take control over the one thing that matters anyways, and that is eternal life. Like it feels like right now COVID-19 has taken all of our self-sufficiency and control, but it hasn't. Death itself, death itself cannot take from us the eternal life that's secured for us in the empty tomb and that is ours when we step in Christ. So uh, look, he is risen. He is risen indeed. You can find tremendous hope and new life in that. And, uh, and with that being said, I think we're at about 40 minutes right now. So he gone, we gone. How about that? Uh, you, guys, you, guys have any, no, you guys have anything else that you wanted to add to that? I think it's a great place to end. Wow. Hey, would you do me a favor at Northeast people? Um, one, uh, would you thank Adrian and Brian for jumping on this on, um, on the Wednesday night and sharing uh, with us their insights, their life, their stories? I'm so thankful uh, for them. Would you share this with anybody that you know who is struggling with mental health issues? Please, please share this. And would you just go ahead and carve into your calendar this weekend to be at one of our services? We're going to talk about COVID-19 and mental health. We're going to look at Philippians chapter four, which I think is one of the most practical uh, passages in all of scripture about practical ways uh, to get through um, your mental health struggles during times like this. And I think we'll all be better because of it. All right. Um, 
He gone. We gone. We love you guys. Continue to love the Ville this week and, uh, and go love your neighbors. We'll see you later. See you guys. Bye.